next presentation dr sanjita is there uh, yes i am there so dr sanjita you can start sharing your screen maybe then dr roshita will get back asha drug induced optic neuropathy you can start on please uh, is my slide visible yes So thank you everybody. Thank you especially NOS and AIOS IOC committee for giving me this opportunity to present my topic today, which is systemic drug induced optic neuropathy more than meets the eye. I am Dr. Sanjita Sitola and I'm working in BP Querela Alliance Center for Ophthalmic Studies. Uh, so to start with, I'd like to introduce some terminologies. So there's terminology adverse drug reaction, which uh, basically means a response to a drug which is noxious and unintended, and which occurs as doses which are normally used in man for the prophylaxis, diagnosis, or for the therapy of diseases. Similarly, there's another term, toxic effect, and that is uh, that means that it is a result of excessive pharmacological action of the drug due to prolonged use or excess dosage. And eye is particularly susceptible to toxic effects of many kinds of drugs. And this is because of its rich vascular supply as well as its small mass. So in 2014, there was a systematic review done to see, uh, look for the ophthalmic adverse drug reactions. And uh, the commonly implicated drugs in this study they found was amiodarone, sildenafil, hydroxychloroquine, and bisphosphonates. However, in our part of the world, in uh, even in India and mostly in Nepal, we see that we are mostly even now dealing with infectious disease and TB is still one of the top diseases and ethambutol has been notorious in causing many of our cases of toxic optic neuropathy in our, uh, in our scenario. So the ocular toxicity of these systemic drugs can involve the anterior segment. For example, in this photograph in the uh, left hand side, we can see a patient with uh, vortex keratopathy in a patient taking hydroxychloroquine. But this was visually insignificant and the patient could continue the drug without any uh, side effects. And in the left, uh, in the right hand side, there is an angry looking red eye in a, uh, with a patient with severe chemosis and scleroeuveitis in a patient taking bisphosphonate, uh, alendronate, uh, which uh, was used for osteoporosis. But even though it was looking so bad, it completely uh, healed without any visual, uh, visual side effect um, after a week of discontinuation of drug and topical and systemic therapy. However, we are more worried about systemic drugs uh, which affect the posterior segment, particularly re the retina and the optic nerves, because they lead to more visually significant side effect and may lead to irreversible vis visual loss later on. So when we talk about drugs causing optic neuropathy, uh, the optic neuropathy can be caused by various mechanisms. So let's first talk about the non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy-like mechanism. So the commonly implicated drugs which lead to ischemia of these optic nerves are the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like the sildenafil, which, was, uh, which is used for erectile dysfunction, and amiodarone. So it is uh, most likely that these drugs cause uh, some compromise in the uh, uh, blood flow of the optic nerve head, leading to ischemic damage of the optic nerve head. The other mechanism which leads to optic neuropathy is due to raised intracranial pressure. Uh, so because of this, the, these patients usually present with papilledema and transient vision loss. And the commonly implicated drugs in this group of um, uh, toxicity is, are the oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapies, patients who take tet tetracycline, corticosteroid, tamoxifen, and vitamin A. And the other group of drug uh, which cause the optic neuropathies are usually the drugs which call the mitochondrial optic neuropathies or acquired mitochondrial optic neuropathies. So these drugs may uh, uh, act by various mechanisms, but what they do is they affect the uh, mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation leading to papillomacular bundle damage, leading to the uh, terminology of toxic optic neuropathy. So the common drugs that we see in this group are, are the isambutol, which causes retrobulbar neuritis. Basically, it's a metal chelator and it chelates the heavy metals like the zinc and copper, leading to the interference with the mitochondrial uh, pathways. Similarly, isoniazid is a, another uh, cause, uh, a rare cause of optic neuritis, and the exact mechanism is not known, but maybe it has something to do with the pyridoxin metabolism. 
Uh, other drugs like methotrexate, uh, they cause optic neuropathy, probably because of uh, folate deficiency. Then there's drugs like chloramphenicol and linozolate, which inhibit the protein synthesis, and mainly they affect the mitochondria, leading to uh, optic neuritis, particularly retrobulbar optic neuritis and chloramphenicol, and you know, sometimes it even leads to dyskinema in case of linozolate. So the clinical presentation of all of these cases of toxic optic neuropathy are gradual, progressive, painless, and usually bilateral symmetrical vision loss affecting the central vision and causing central or sicocentral scotoma because of the involvement of the papillomacular bundle. Depending upon the uh, drug that is that we use, depending upon the severity and the chronicity of the disease, the optic nerve may be normal in the initial stages, or there may be edema in a few cases, and when it has uh, in, it's in the advanced stage, it might lead to temporal pallor or even a pale disc. And all of these drugs are uh, usually the withdrawal of the offending drug can lead to some improvement of vision, or at least there is a halt in the progression of the vision loss. So let's look at our experience of optic neuropathy at our center. Uh, so we had did, uh, done a hospital-based prox prospective observational study uh, where we tried to assess the ocular toxicity among patients treating uh, taking antitubercular drug, where we followed up 45 cases of newly diagnosed anti uh, patients uh, of TB who were taking ATT for less than one month. So we did investigations like color vision, contrast, visual field, OCT, and baseline visit and followed these patients up for six months to see whether they developed optic neuropathy or not. So in our cohort of 45 patients, we found that uh, only um, uh, around 18% of the patients were receiving, uh, who had uh, severe extrapulmonary tuberculosis, had um, ethambutal for more than two months. The rest, 82% of the cases had ethambutal for only two months. And the mean daily dose of ethambutal in these patients was 17.9 patients, 17.91 uh, milligram per kg. And uh, the mean duration of the ethambutal that they, they, they had taken was 2.7 plus minus 1.5, which is a relatively low dose and duration for patients taking ethambutal. And in this work, in, in our study, we came across only one patient, which around 2.2% of um, cases had ATT induced optic neuropathy. So the patient who developed optic neuropathy was a patient with pot spine who had received six months of ethambutal at a dose of 20 milligram per kg per day. And at the time of presentation, she had a history of uh, 15 days of um, loss of vision. The visual acuity at that time was 636 and the color vision showed non-specific defect with a, and the contrast had dropped to 1.75. At this time, the optic nerves were, fundus findings were normal and the optic nerves looked pink uh, uh, and there was no pallor at present. However, the visual fields uh, showed, uh, the Goldman visual field showed the classical uh, secocentral scotoma in both of the eyes and the VEP showed delayed latencies. However, at the same time, we were coming over across many other patients of ethambutal toxicity. So during the same period of two years, we also were collecting other patients who had been who were not included in our study, but had been referred else from elsewhere who uh, had a suspicion of optic neuropathy. So there were at least 14 patients of optic neuropathy. And now, all of these patients uh, were the co-patients who had either severe extrapulmonary TB or who were under retreatment or who had uh, resistant uh, drug resistance tuberculosis. And the mean duration of ethambutal that they had uh, received was you know, for more than 7.25 months, and the mean dose was 18.27 uh, milligram per kg. So we know that ethambutal is uh, dose and duration related. And if various studies have already proven that ethambutal given at a dose for um, more than 35 milligram can cause, cause toxicity as high as 18%, whereas with a standard dose of 15 milligram per kg per day, the toxicity is less than 1% when given for more than two months. The government of Nepal has done a wonderful program uh, of national TB control where they are working very hard to reduce the incidence of TB. And to make the treatment easier, we have a 
a standard protocol for patients who receive the TB uh, treatment. We can see that depending upon the weight, we, uh, the patients receive various doses of tablets. But in our study, what we found was patients who fell on the lower range of the, um, uh, who fell on the lower ends of the weight band. For example, if the patient was 40 kg, he was receiving three tablets in comparison to a patient who was 39 kg who would receive only two tablets. So the patient who fell on the lower end of the weight band, they were uh, had a higher risk of developing uh, ethambutal induced toxicity. And that also happened in a patient with TB who, was, who might be 40 kg initially when they started on ATT. But if the patient loses um, uh, weight and uh, 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 that is not calculated and taken into account. So we have to also um, make sure that the patient are receiving the correct doses according to the weight, uh, even in, in spite of the dose uh, weight fluctuation. Apart from uh, that, we also came across one patient who had linozolid-induced optic neuropathy in this cohort of patient. So it was a patient with TB pleural, pleural effusion, and the patient was having intolerance to many uh, drugs. So he had to stop most of the drugs. So the, uh, the treatment treating physician st uh, started this patient with ethambutol and linozolid for nine months. So after seven months of ethambutal, the patient started having deterioration of the vision and ethambutal was stopped. But because there was no other option, linezolid was continued. And when the vision continued to deteriorate, despite uh, stopping ethambutal, linezolid was, uh, the, uh, the patient was referred to our center. At the time of presentation, the visual acuity was uh, counting fingers in both eyes and the patient had bilateral dog, <clears throat> temporal pallor. So we did MRI to find out if there were any other causes, everything was normal. So we uh, suspected this patient to have bilateral toxic optic neuropathy due to both linezolid as well as ethambutal. So this was uh, <clears throat> the, at the time of presentation to our center. Now coming to the discussion part, uh, Though it is a quite a common problem that we face, uh, physicians are often not referring the patients to us in time because of which the, most of these patients end with irreversible visual loss. So we need to identify the patients at risk because we know that so many patients receive ATT and it might not be possible to monitor and follow up each of these patients. So we know that it is dose and duration related. So if we are able to find out the cohort of patients who are receiving ethanbutyl for a longer period, for example, severe extrapulmonary tuberculosis patients or drug-resistant tuberculosis patients, we might <clears throat> it might be easier, and the patients might benefit from it. And in our part of the world, still antimicrobial therapy, particularly ATT toxic optic neuropathy, is more common than the other types of toxic uh, neuropathy. And early diagnosis and stopping the offending drug is the only treatment at present. So I'd like uh, to end my presentation uh, with this slide. Uh, so to spread awareness of toxic optic neuropathy.